Hi, I'm Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life, and I'm very happy to welcome Father Eusebius Schwald, who is the vocation director of the Order of Canons Regular of Holy Cross. Father, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Excellent. Well, before we begin our amazing topic today, would you mind leading us in prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of consecrated life. We thank you for calling people into your service, for giving them your love, ex letting experience them your love, so that they get attracted to you and are ready to follow your son, Jesus, who called us to be so close to him in religious life. And we ask you that through this um, conversation we have now, and we are guided by the Holy Spirit, that we may be understanding what's your holy will, that we may, yes, guide it deeper into the mysteries of your Son, especially the holy angels, and be enlightened and guided so that we can follow you ever better and love you ever more. To Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, uh, before we get to our topic today, I always like to talk to our, you know, interviewees about how they found the religious life and, and how they came to realize that that was their vocation. So can you tell me a little bit about your story, your vocation story? Okay, yeah, that's an important question. <laughs> it was life changing. <laughs> so uh, I want to... Um, I would like to, to share, no? first, I, you know, you hear my accent, I'm a German. So I was born and raised in Germany and uh, went to high school here. And my parents, my family, I'm one of four children. I'm the oldest in the family. Um, we were raised Catholic. My parents are very religious. My mother uh, is a catechist. My father is uh, a lector in the parish and a Eucharistic lay minister. So uh, we grew up in that very Catholic uh, surrounding. But, you know, one thing that happened uh, when I was around 11 years old, in that time, um, Medjugorje uh, started, and I was invited uh, to join my mother and my grandmother uh, to a pilgrimage. So we went to Medjugorje, and there, for the first time, no, it was already an altar server, but there for the first time I could really like experience the, or feel uh, the presence of uh, the Lord, the presence of his mother. And there was uh, left a very big impact in me. And I think it was during that time that I felt already attracted to give my life to God. So I grew up in, in high school and um, yeah, I was active in the church. And then slowly I uh, developed my vocation. Uh, I have to say it's always related to our blessed mother, she was very crucial in my vocation, uh, not only because of Medjugorje, but uh, yeah, I went many times to Marian shrines, and it was in that where my faith in the Lord and uh, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ grew deeper, and uh, yeah, to the point uh, that uh, I, I really felt attracted to the, the priesthood. Uh, I wanted to become a diocesan priest, uh, but then um, getting to know a religious life, I was in a a monastery once, uh, and it was very impressive to me when uh, the monks guided us through this monastery and they opened a door and we just standing from you know, almost from the rooms of the, the monks uh, to in, in, the, in the church and the, in the chapel. So I was really impressed to live so closely to the Lord and that left an impression on me. And then uh, later, when I was discerning really at the end of high school, uh, then I decided uh, that I wanted to uh, give everything uh, to the Lord in religious life. And uh, it was already some years before that, that I got to know the order of the Holy Cross. Uh, the priests of this order um, made a big impression on me. Um, I felt like this was something authentic and uh, something deep. And uh, I perceived they were faithful to the church. Uh, that's also in our time not so easy anymore to find that. So uh, this uh, very this fidelity to the magisterium uh, was very a very, very important criteria for me. But also adoration, Eucharistic adoration, I felt very attracted to that. Um, and um, yes, uh, the passion 
the passion of Jesus, uh, I found out that this order uh, wanted to fight for the salvation of souls. And for that reason, uh, the, the brothers and the priests would uh, yeah, every week celebrate the Passio Domini, the passion of the Lord, uh, joining Jesus in his passion every Thursday evening by adoration, uh, in the agony, in the garden. And then on, on Friday uh, afternoon, 12 to 3, we would have another adoration time uh, to accompany Jesus in, in, on, on the cross and just to unite with him and to thirst with him for souls. Uh, that's, so um, when I got to know this order, I, I went a few times to a come and see experience or vocation retreat. Uh, and then it became, became clear to me that uh, this is where the Lord wanted me. And uh, then I joined the order. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That is so great, especially to hear what a vocation story is like in a okay. totally different country. Obviously, uh, Germany has a very rich monastic history, you know, right. all these Benedictine abbeys that come from there. But I'm very curious as to what it was like when you were young to uh, to be in the culture of, of Germany and European culture as you were trying to discover your faith. What was that like for you? Okay, well, <laughs> I have to add that uh, the formation that I had then in the order, uh, I joined the order in Austria, in our mother house. Uh, so it was already a little change. But then I studied in Brazil. <laughs> so we have our seminary there. And of course, that was a big change. And then uh, I was um, assigned as a deacon after my study in um, Bogota, in Colombia. So that was uh, a different culture again. And uh, then after that, I was ordained a priest in Austria in the Cathedral of Innsbruck. And after that, I was sent already to the United States. Uh, we had our house in Michigan, in the uh, Detroit area. So I was assigned in a parish. Uh, to yeah, to exercise the priestly ministry at the beginning of my priesthood. And then after that, I spent 14 years in the Philippines. Uh, so that was, <laughs> I just came back actually uh, in February. Uh, so that was, uh, was quite an <laughs> experience. Uh, but uh, being in Ohio, actually I'm quite happy because of the uh, um, the climate, uh, the climate is, uh, is more similar to that in, in Germany, or actually practically the same. And um, yeah, of course, the culture in Ohio is, uh, in the United States is different, but I learned to adjust and to appreciate every culture uh, and, and to find out what's the, <laughs> what's the strength of this culture and to just to fit in. Uh, somehow, like what St. Paul says, you have I mean, you have that missionary heart, you have to adjust yourself or uh, cry with the crying, huh? um, laugh with the laugh, uh, those who are laughing. And uh, when you have that spirit, it's not difficult to adjust. That, that is amazing. Obviously, you got to experience the, the universal church in a way that not all of us get to do. So that's great. I noticed that there is this thread of devotions in your story as well. And I'm wondering how important that was uh, in your vocation story and in, in your realization. And how did you know that that was leading you to an authentic uh, calling to the religious life rather than, you know, that's just a feeling? Okay. Um, well, um, when you are, um, actually before I joined the order, uh, I had a hard time because on one side, I already felt, felt attracted to, to, the, to be an, a parish priest. Huh? And on the other side, this um, attraction to the spirituality of the order. Uh, and then I, I made, um, yeah, I, I did some, I did a retreat actually before my graduation to find out what the Lord really wanted. And that was, was during Holy Week. And at the end of the Holy Week, uh, when I, I went back to the parish, or, or let's say for Holy, Thur uh, Holy Thursday celebration, I went back to the parish, uh, to my home parish, to serve at Mass. And then um, I was still not sure. <laughs> so that was so hard. But then uh, when on, on Good Friday, you know, when the priest was uh, prostrate there in front of the altar, and, and uh, we all knelt down to commemorate the, the Lord's Passion, that somehow gave that point uh, to me and say, okay, you no, know, when I want to save souls, uh, like the, the Lord didn't save souls through his preaching, uh, but he saved souls through his 
passion. And when I wanted to save souls, then I I have to give him that, that everything. You know? I have to place myself into the sacrifice of the cross. Yeah, so that was somehow decisive. Yes. Now, you talk a lot about the passion and, and uh, how that is such an, an amazing uh-huh. way to encounter Christ. But a lot of us don't understand why we can find or how we can find joy in suffering. So can you, can you walk me through that? What, what is so amazing about this suffering, seeing Christ on the cross? Uh-huh. Well, you know, uh, when, I, when I was about to join the order, I told a friend of mine who was a seminarian in, in the diocese, and then he said, well, you better don't join that order <laughs> because like to meditate on the passion or on the suffering of the Lord is somehow depressing. <laughs> so, and, and then, then I, when I joined the order, then, uh, or when I saw the people in the order, I had the, the, the exact the opposite impression. Uh, I saw they are happy people. And then I found out that actually uh, to join Jesus in the passion doesn't make you sad or depressed, but it's the opposite here. Uh, through the cross, now you learn how to face challenges in your life, how to unite them to Christ and how to overcome certain difficulties. And then uh, it's the way to joy. Huh? It doesn't doesn't make you depressed. <laughs> so, yes. So that's my experience. Mm-hmm. It, you had talked a little bit earlier about, you know, possibly you were called to the diocesan priesthood, but a big part of religious life is living in community. So right. what was that like for you in your, you know, discernment process right. and kind of living in community yes. now? Um, that was then a very important aspect uh, too for me uh, because I learned, uh, yeah, I learned better how to relate to others. I learned how that there are wonderful people like, now, I told you I was in Brazil, Colombia, and, and other countries, Philippines, and I got to know wonderful brothers yeah, now in these communities, and it's something very enriching. So I discovered that. Now, actually, I never wanted to leave Germany, but then <laughs> sudden, somehow the Lord pulled me out of my comfort zone <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and opened uh, the mind to me for other cultures, for, for other brothers, and it's just... Uh, so great when you can go home, for example, from a pastoral commitment, and you can talk to someone. Right? You can talk to your brothers what happened. You can ask the advice or, or you can uh, yeah, um, communicate that to them. It's uh, very different. So I feel very attracted to that. And I learn a lot also from other cultures, from other brothers uh, yeah, in the whole world. Mm-hmm. My last question before we get to our topic today is, you've obviously also moved around a lot. You've spent time in the Philippines and South uh-huh. America and America. What is that obedience like in a religious community? Because right. it's, again, it's different than the diocesan priesthood. You right. know, you are, you're obedient to your bishop, but what is it the obedience like in a religious community where maybe you have a lot of really great things going on and then, well, yeah, you're, you're gone. You got to go somewhere else. Yes. <clears throat> um. There's a truth behind that because once you serve people for several years, um, you somehow you know, they appreciate you, you love them, you know them, you create friendships, and then after a time, <laughs> there comes that message from uh, the call from the superior general and says, "Can you help us in, in this or that country, in this or that station?" And then, and then you say, "Okay, uh, like." Um, at the beginning, you have a little struggle, of course. You don't want to uh, leave behind people who are dear to you. But then um, somehow you have to think, the Lord is now waiting for me in that country. <laughs> no? So he wants me to be there. And, uh, and then the separation and, uh, opens then a way for, for new encounters, for new friendships. And uh, today I have to say uh, it's wonderful not to have uh, people around the world who are your friends and and who you were able to touch you know, their, their life, their faith, and you leave somehow footprints in, in different places. So it's a wonderful way, yes. And, and uh, I want to shift things now to our topic at hand, which is uh, how to pray to our guardian angels or, or how to interact or engage with our guardian angels and, and the angels in general. So you're obviously very passionate right. about this. We were talking mm-hmm. about it a little bit earlier yes. and and uh, last night as we were preparing. 
But what is it about angels that is so important to us as Christians? Yes. You know, uh, when I grew up, I always prayed to my guardian angel, the famous prayer angel of God. Uh, and somehow I, no, oh, certainly I believed in my guardian angel, but that you can relate to him. Uh, that was something new for me, that you can make friends with your guardian angel. So when I joined the order at the beginning, I was somehow surprised in that note because in our community, um, this order was actually founded in 1132 and died out in, in the 19th century in Portugal. So uh, after almost uh, 70 years or 80 years, in 1979, the order was restored uh, by a movement that is called Opus Angelorum. No, maybe you heard that already. It's like a, a big movement, uh, and this movement promotes a friendship with the angels. So that was uh, something uh, new for me. And uh, But then when, once you discover uh, the angels, it's something amazing, <laughs> because, you know, God uh, created these angels not to be like bystanders or just up there in heaven, uh, uh, just to to decorate heaven, like sometimes in our churches, the angels are for decoration, you know, where they hold the holy water, uh, but but they're not really um, like interacting with us. That's, that's the impression I had. So when I learned you now that the angels are very close to you, that your guardian angel is actually so spe special, that God chose him among all the angels uh, only for you, like that angel that you have at your side is not uh, like an angel of another person who passed away already, and now is your guardian angel, but it seems only that he was, yeah, that he was chosen exactly or created even uh, to be at your side and to guide you. Uh, that's something amazing. Uh, and God wants this interaction with the angels. We've seen the Holy Scripture many times. Uh, the angels are mentioned from the first book of the Holy Scripture until the last book, and they are just um, interacting with us they're guiding us, they're warning us sometimes, uh, sometimes admonishing us, other times they strengthen us, you know? like Jesus in the garden, uh, just before his passion was strengthened, uh, or they, they guide us to Jesus. Uh, it's so wonderful. Like whenever uh, God and men meet uh, together, like or come together, or God wants to meet men, like he sends the angels ahead to prepare the way, and the angels somehow facilitate this um, this encounter between God and man. Huh? So now you can relate to your angel. You can talk to him. You can make him part of your life. Now you can thank him for what he's doing. And um, the beautiful about the angels is they help us in the battle huh? because our life is much about battle. And they help us to serve God uh, together together. Huh? Uh, with our Blessed Mother, like the angel Gabriel came down from heaven to bring the message to Mary, her vocation practically, and uh, even to St. Joseph, we have the year of St. Joseph. Uh, no, St. Joseph was all the time was guided by the angel uh, to tell him what to do, to enlighten him about the will of God. So that's what the angel doing, and it's so interesting, like uh, just um, whenever I need something or when I do something, I call the angels, and they really help. No, they really intercede. They, they uh, just this morning I le I found something uh, that I had uh, uh, left in some place, and it appeared again. I was praying to my guardian angel to find this item again, and suddenly it fell out of the pocket. No, it was there, and and it's just amazing that uh, what the angels do for us. No? So yes. That reminds me of a story that one of my friends told me, not a story, but he says, if you ever lose something and uh, you want, you need to find it, he says, pray that St. Anthony and your yes. guardian angel race to help you find it. And if you find it in a really practical place, like a place it should be that uh, St. Anthony helped you find it. But if you find it in a really weird place, like you left your car keys in the microwave, that your guardian angel uh, <laughs> helped you find it. So I always thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that kept, you know, pinging in my brain as you were talking about intercessory prayer with angels is, and, and the way they support and help us is uh, there's a lot of Holy Spirit, uh, you know, ideas popping in my head. Is there some, is there a connection between the Holy Spirit and the, and the angels? Okay. 
Yeah, you know, uh, since the angels are very, uh, they're spiritual beings and they're actually messengers of God. Uh, so, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit is also God. So the, the Holy Spirit uses uh, the angels uh, to guide us, uh, to enlighten us. And I heard once, um, I don't remember where I read that, that uh, like the Holy Spirit gives you that light, uh, and then the guardian angel somehow shapes it so that it would fit to you in that moment. No? So it's um, like what exactly what you need. No? Because the guardian angel is very personal and is at your side, and he, he knows you best. No? So uh, somehow the, the angel is a messenger, uh, then brings uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit to you. No? I know that there are some people out there who probably are apprehensive about, you know, starting to have a prayerful relationship with their guardian angel. So what are some ways that people can do that where they can start to practice and build their relationship with their guardian angel or just the communion of, of angels in general? Uh huh. Well, actually, that's a common objection. Why should I relate to my guardian angel when I can uh, relate to the Lord himself, uh, but you know, our Catholic Church is very much about communion, and the Lord shares himself, no? uh, his power, his love, uh, through the angels to us. No? So it's not a, a, a different way, and um, our founders, the founders of the Opus Angelorum said once that um, the angels are like a telescope, yes, uh, in which you can see God better, yes. So it's not something that separates you, from, but from opening your heart to all uh, experts, you can say, to the angels, uh, to uh, people around you who are close to God, uh, to opening yourself to a communion with others, uh, with the angels, with the saints in heaven, with people who love Christ on, on earth, uh, it enriches you. Right? It doesn't separate you. It doesn't bring you away from God. But when you have an expert at your side who can, 24 hours, he can see God. No? Why not consult him once in a while and ask him to guide you? No? So the angels are not just there to um, maybe, uh, um, how to say, find lost items. But first of all, that's the, the first task of the angels to guide us to God, no? to warn us when we commit sin, to to draw us out again out of the mud when we committed a sin and to, to guide us to God. No? So that's the first task of the angels. And what are some practical day-to-day -day tips that can you know, help us begin that process? Um, actually, in the Opus Angelorum, that's the movement we promote in the Order of the Holy Cross. We promote a consecration to the guardian angel. Now we can, uh, that was approved by the Holy See in the year 2000. And the Opus Angelorum was approved in the year 2008. Uh, so something new still that you can do. And uh, I invite you, you know, to sign up for this consecration. You, you can do that through our website, uh, opusangelorum.org. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you, know, you can deepen your relationship through that just by starting to talk to your guardian angel. But we can send you also some information material or formation material that will help you to connect to your guardian angel. Another question that I have is that I think people might be confused a little bit about uh, the difference between intercessory prayer in regard to maybe a uh, guardian angel or angels and saints. What is the difference between, you know, that process of prayer or that encounter of prayer uh, when we're involving the saints or the angels? What's the difference there? Okay, uh, of course, we can invoke uh, everyone, <laughs> the angels, the saints, uh, but somehow since the guardian angel was assigned personally no, to you only. So uh, he's like the messenger of God to you personally. No? When you die, your guardian angel will stay at your side in heaven. No? So this, um, uh, while the, the saints are for everyone, yes? Like when you call on St. Therese or when you call on St. Anthony, uh, it's for everyone. No? But your guardian angel is very particular assigned to you. And uh, in addition, of course, you can ask the intercession of saints and and other, you know, the whole host of angels, there are billions of them. Uh, and you can unite to your angel even you know, uh, in adoration when you go to the Blessed Sacrament, uh, just to adore him, uh, the Lord, uh, together with your guardian angel. It's a communion you know, because God assigned him to you. 
Absolutely. And, and you mentioned this before, but we see angels in a lot in church architecture. And what does that mean? What are we supposed to do when we see that in a church? We see a painting or a mosaic or a statue mm-hmm. of angels. What is that supposed right. to convey to us about maybe the heavenly right. reality? Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes in art, angels are not really represented properly. Now, when an angel appears in the Holy Scripture, it's like... Uh, uh, people are afraid or, or in awe because of the holiness of an angel. But in art, you see sometimes those little, uh, we call them cherubs, no? <laughs> like uh, like naked <laughs> babies with wings. But uh, this gives a wrong impression of angels. Now the angels are powerful and and are beautiful and much beyond our imagination. St. John, in the book of Revelation, when he saw an angel, he wanted to adore him because he thought it might be God. And the angel said, no, don't adore me. I'm just you know, a fellow servant like you. So that's something very um, yeah, very enlightening because um, uh, yeah, sometimes we don't have the best representations of angels in our uh, architecture. That's right. Father, if somebody is interested in some of these things that we've been talking about, especially in regard to the charisms of your religious community, where can they go to find out more? Are they interested in maybe okay. a vocational yes. community or they want to do a vocational visit? Um, actually, you can go to our website. Uh, that's grusios.org. And um, you can um, search for the Order of the Holy Cross in Ohio or the Opus Angelorum. Uh, you will find that. And if you feel attracted to Eucharistic adoration, if you uh, yes, feel attracted to fight in the spiritual battle with the angels together against evil, and if you uh, yes would like to give your life to God, then you, you're most welcome to, uh, to come to visit us and to make an experience here. And then we can uh, help you to discern your vocation. Actually, we are right now building a monastery, uh, St. Gabriel Monastery, it's new. Um, so we just recently actually moved here some years ago, and uh, now with the help of St. Joseph, we are able to build a monastery, so uh, we will be able to better accommodate people here and, and in the nature of Ohio and make this uh, yes, experience. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I, I really do hope that uh, some of you maybe go out there, uh, even if you're not looking for a vocation, if you guys are open to visitors to go out and check that out. Uh, Father, before we close today, would you mind giving myself a blessing and, and everybody else who is watching? To the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to the intercession of the Holy Angels, especially St. Michael, Gabriel and Raphael Archangels, the intercession of your guardian angels, and all the angels and saints, May Almighty God bless you, protect you, guide you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Father, thank you so much again for joining us. It was such a pleasure, and I really hope we can do this again. And uh, thank you, and God bless. Okay, thank you, uh, Jesse, also for this opportunity, and uh, greetings to all of you. I keep you in my prayers.